Hi everyone at PlutoCon. My name is Nathan from Relational AI, and thanks for having us here to talk about uh, reactive notebooks. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, I work for Relational AI. If you haven't heard of it, it's uh, uh, a company we've uh, been at JuliaCon for a couple years, and we're building a knowledge graph management system uh, built entirely in Julia um, for to, to bring knowledge graphs to the world. Um, we believe that relational knowledge graphs are the foundation for future data centric systems, systems that learn, reason, and predict over richly interconnected data. And I'm reading this from our website, which is here at relational.ai slash learn, where you can go to hear a lot more about what our company is and what a knowledge graph is and, and why we think this is the future. But the reason that I'm here today is because uh, you may have noticed this isn't a Pluto notebook. It's a reactive notebook that we've built ourselves uh, starting just at the beginning of this year um, for our knowledge graph management system, which was heavily inspired by the Pluto notebooks. So we, we love Pluto, just like we love Jupiter here at Relational AI, and, and just like we love Julia. Um, and um, we really love the way that reactive notebooks let you um, play with your data, explore your programs, uh, and also uh, uh, produce a document to share with people, to, to uh, teach uh, about your work. And um, our, our database management system, our knowledge graph management system um, benefits from all of those same things. So um, I'll walk you through in this notebook here a bit about what we're doing at Relational AI to give you some context uh, for what our product is like and why we needed a notebook in the first place. And then I'll walk through a few interesting places where um, we made decisions that were very heavily inspired by what Pluto does um, and some places where we were, we, we were able to do different things um, thanks to some of the uh, fundamental principles of our, of our knowledge graph management system that's different than a programming language like Julia and some of the things it lets us do that are pretty exciting, I think. So um, to start with, um, the knowledge graph management system is um, is a, a store for your data in the same way that a database is a, is a place to store your data. Um, but it's more than a database, it's a knowledge graph. And, and what that means really, I think uh, the easiest way to think about it is that um, it means that your data isn't restricted to living only in tables or data frames, but rather can be um, expressed in lots of different uh, facts about your data, all connected, lots of different pieces of knowledge, all connected in a graph. And so, for example, for some items, um, like if you're a store and you sell books and pizza, like in this example, um, books have an author, but pizza doesn't. And pizza has a flavor, but books don't. And um, you can keep all of that information in, in, your, in your same system. So in this example, um, we're looking at using a notebook, this, this notebook environment, to interact with that knowledge graph management system, to, to interact, with, interact with a knowledge graph or a database by, in this case, inserting facts. So um, this, uh, this, this line right here, um, is printing out the sales table that we have so far. So in this example on, uh, you can see a couple of days ago, we sold two books and then one book and uh, one piece of pizza yesterday. And then uh, today we've sold two pizzas already. And um, now I might come in and say, actually, we also sold two books today. And so I can insert this fact into the database. And so through the notebook, I'm actually making stateful modifications to um, the underlying data store. And uh, unlike a Pluto notebook uh, or other fully uh, declared of reactive notebooks, um, it's okay to make changes like this that affect the state because fundamentally a database is all about manipulating states. This is one of those places where our needs are slightly different than Jupiter's. Um, and so here, when you uh, make a change into the notebook, um, you can see that once this is inserted, we keep track of all the other cells in the notebook and how they're affected by that state. So in this case, this cell refers to sales. And in this cell, we modified sales statefully. And so we had to flow that change through all the affected cells and rerun them as we did here. And so then this, this got printed out. Um, so if I wanted to go back and add like, oh, maybe also I sold, um, I sold some pizza on the first day. And when I insert this fact, um, it'll also rerun the, the, the uh, re-render this again. Um, so you can see we, we still have some latency problems caused by um, compiling everything into Julia. And we, we share some of the latency problems that other Julia programs have of uh, having high compilation times. So we're still working through that right now. 
Um, but like I said, uh, this whole notebook environment is really new. And part of the joy of being able to interact with things through a UI like this is, is we're starting to actually see and experience those interactive snappy moments. And, and now it shows us where to, where to work on performance. Okay, so we have this knowledge graph management system here, the ability to manage your data and your knowledge graph. Um, I wanted to talk about another exciting part of our product, which is the RHEL language. And that's the language that I've been writing up here and, and down below. Um, so this is our query language. It's a query language, a declarative query language in the same way that uh, SQL or data log are query languages, if you've ever worked with any of those. They're languages for working with data. Um, but um, one of the things that's really exciting about our language is that it's extremely expressive and it makes our engine makes heavy use of our of our semantic optimizer, which is a very advanced uh, query optimizer. And what this lets us do is um, write programs. This is the beauty of declarative language. You can write programs in a declarative way, which means you just write the what that you want, not the how to do it. So uh, in this really simple example of Fibonacci, which is a cool recursive program and a, a fun one to think about, we write the very basic definition of Fibonacci, the most natural one. So I'll explain that real quick here. Um, if you've ever seen the Fibonacci sequence, it's the sequence that goes 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. Every number is the addition of the two numbers before it. So we can write that in rel like this by saying in the base case for the first two numbers, they're 0 and 1. And then after that, the value of Fibonacci is whatever the value of Fibonacci was before plus the one two before for every n. Uh, and in this case, we're doing n up to 10. So for any n, the value of Fibonacci is n. Fibonacci n minus 1 plus Fibonacci n minus 2. You've certainly seen this before if you've ever seen recursion in any language. You could write this in Julia. Um, but the neat thing about this is you've probably heard that you're not supposed to actually write it this way. This is the most natural explanation of what the Fibonacci sequence is, but it's not very performant if you, uh, if you actually recursively uh, write it like this in an imperative language. But the cool thing about a semantic optimizer is that our optimizer can automatically go ahead and rewrite this. So you saw how just instantly, as soon as I ran that, uh, changed that number, we were able to compute all the numbers one through 10 of the Fibonacci, one through 100 of the Fibonacci sequence. And I, I don't actually know, I've never seen Fibonacci numbers this high. There's some integer overflows here, so I don't actually know if they're correct, but they're fast. And it even goes up to a thousand, which uh, really stunned me when I was preparing this demo in, in just a few seconds. Um, and to compare that, for those of you who've never done this before, if you try writing this exact same definition in any imperative language like Julia, the naive implementation of Fibonacci, it very quickly balloons, even at around 44, it's a few seconds, and at 50, it's hundreds of seconds. Um, so the cool thing about writing a declarative language with a powerful optimizer is you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You just write the, the, the obvious explanation for your, for your output, and the optimizer will turn this into the more efficient declare, uh, uh, dynamic programming algorithm for solving Fibonacci. Okay, and then the last thing I wanna talk about in today's example is we are also a, a machine learning framework, and that's because um, we wanna support any kinds of things you might do to uh, work with your data to build up knowledge. And so we support knowledge that's constructed by hand um, via logic and rules like we saw up above. But we also wanna support knowledge that's learned from examples and, and, and we wanna support both equally well. So in this example um, here, I've, I've loaded a CSV into a data frame, uh, which has the circumference and the height and the volume of a bunch of trees. And um, now maybe I wanna learn a machine learning model so that if I see some future trees, if I can measure their circumference and their height, I wanna predict their volume because you can't predict, you can't measure the volume of something without cutting it down. And so um, I wanna start with this sample data and then train a model to predict the volume. So to do that in rel, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you get the values out of the data frame and we use them to build up features and responses we're gonna train with. So this looks like sort of standard machine learning. Uh, we wanna say for any tree T, the features we're looking at are its height and its circumference. And we're trying to use those to predict its volume. And so here we're using the GLM framework, which is an external machine learning framework. Um, and we train a linear regression with those features. And we can see here that um, in the output of this table, we have the, um, the predicted volume against our true volume. And we do pretty well. That's not great, but it's pretty well. We can, we can compare this by uh, looking at, what is it? Um, we can compute the, the error rate by checking to see how close our, uh, something like that, right? Uh, by checking to see how close our, uh, our, our calculation was, and we'll put the absolute value in here. I think it should be something like that. Um, and we got a lot of errors here. Live reactive programming. 
Um, almost done. Oh, I'm sorry, predictions. Aha. Um, wow, okay, like I said, there's compilation problems. Yeah, there we go. So now you can see here that we added a column to compute the errors. So, um, so we've been working on our knowledge graph management system for a few years now, and it's actually being used in production by our customers already. Um, but we've only just started putting together this UI, this built-in UI for working with it. And uh, we were inspired by many other systems, including, of course, Pluto. And here are some other ones that I listed. But one of the things that I wanted to really highlight is that um, this notebook is exciting because it lets us build on the reactivity of the knowledge graph management engine itself. So um, we're working with a fully declarative language, whereas for other things like observable HQ and for Pluto, we're trying to strap functional programming on top of an imperative language that has side effects. And you've got to be really careful. What if, what if someone writes a cell that has a side effect, like it reads from a file or something, and you change that file, or you, you know, you have some other that that side effect is relied on in a different cell, you lose that gap in between. And we get all of that for free because our compiler and our execution engine are all ac architected from the ground up for live programming. You may have seen our salsa talk at JuliaCon last year, and um, we talked there about the engine that we use for tracking dependencies to make sure everything is fully reactive. So that means this notebook engine is very simple. Um, we don't have to do anything in the front end to track reactivity, and um, we can build around the features of the, of the database engine, including even having stateful operations like I showed up above. Um, and so the other cool things that I was saying is that this provides a view into the state in the database, which is different than, than um, a notebook for a programming language where really just the thing that happens in the notebook is the entirety of the program. But here we have to, we're, we're, we're modeling against a data model that's inside the database and we have to expose that to the notebook. So that's like an interesting angle that we're thinking about. Um, and then uh, same as other notebooks, it, it provides a playground for building and exploring those models. So, okay, I did wanna um, go through a couple other quick notebooks. I have just a few minutes remaining. Um, here's an example. Um, oh, it's too bad. Here's an example of working with the iris flower data set, um, which is a very standard uh, data set. And here um, you can see that, uh, generated a plot um, where we are um, plotting the sepal width against the sepal length. And so this example here is just to show that um, uh, uh, the notebook should, should support um, rich uh, rendering, just like in Pluto. And we actually use the same trick as Pluto uses both for this and for the, the tables you see below. We return the value as a MIME type. This, we got this idea from Julia and Jupiter. Uh, sorry, yeah, from Julia and its use in Jupiter and Pluto. Um, and uh, so the values return a MIME type, and then the front end knows how to render that, that MIME type um, accordingly. And so this means that um, there's nothing built in special to our notebook for rendering any kinds of plots or anything. It's just, it's just code. And so um, once we have support for uh, user-defined libraries and frameworks and packages and things, um, anybody can write up a, a targeting library for, for RHEL, which is pretty neat. Um, and um, yeah, so this, this is the main thing I wanted to show from this example. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of working against some database state. This is something that's different than um, other uh, other reactive notebooks. So in a reactive notebook, if you make a change somewhere, um, it, it reflects that change throughout. But we also have this stateful interaction with the database. And so in this silly example, I have a Vega plot here. I'm plotting a bar chart from some data and that data is very simple. It's just uh, plotting A and B, which are some relations defined up here. Um, and so here we can see B is defined as A plus two. And if we change B to be A plus five, it'll immediately change the, the plot um, in the same way that you would see in Pluto. Um, when you make a change to a definition somewhere else, it, it flows through the thing. And that's the normal reactivity we're used to. But we also have this stateful reactivity like I've talked about. And so this third column is the number of times that you've clicked a button and um, this was this example is kind of silly, but it's inspired by the cool interactivity we get in Pluto with binding. And so here um, we have another staple operation in the database, which says insert into the num clicks variable, whatever num clicks was before plus one, and then delete the old value out of num clicks. So you can see we're printing out num clicks here in the output. And every time we click this button, if I click it four more times, um, we get uh, this value increasing. And also the plot down here is increasing. So um, every time we make a stateful change to the database, that change is reflected in all the, the rest of the notebook. So there's kind of these 
two different things. There's the, the changes to the installed logic in the notebook, the, the definitions in the notebook, which flow through reactively, just like in a Pluto notebook. And then we also have uh, changes to state flowing through, which I think is a cool um, other angle than, than normal React notebooks have seen in the past. And it lets this be really useful for modeling data and interacting with data. And you can imagine if you have a, a program that's, you, you have a, a model that's set up modeling the stock market. And every time there's a new buy or sell on the stock market, it's inserting facts into your database and your models are reacting live. And you can, you can watch your, your um, models on your notebook and use it kind of like a dashboard. And you maybe even have some machine learning, uh, uh, keeping a, a model up to date, constantly refreshing it as new, as new entries are coming in. And you can track all of this uh, in the notebook live, which is pretty cool. Um, and this other last example I want to talk about is just really digging into this state change. Um, in this example, uh, we have some, some table here that has the grade of a bunch of students in a course. So um, for every test, it's called a test grade. So uh, let's say so far, um, I got an 80 on the midterm and Stefan got a 90 and Huda got a 99 and Li Jia got an 80. And then I also have our majors. There's another table in here. This is a, the knowledge graph thing. Now we're connecting a different piece of knowledge, which is the major of every student. So Huda is a computer science major, same as me. Li Jia and Stefan are physics majors. So you might ask like, can we compute the class average by major? I'm, I'm wondering if the, if the computer science students are doing better in this course for whatever reason. So I'm gonna do a little live programming here. So this class averages by major, we wanna, we wanna compute the average by major. Um, so for any given major, of course, you're not familiar with this language yet, but um, I'll try to explain it as I go. So the average for any given major is going to be the mean of all the uh, test grades for every student um, where that student's major, uh, sorry, for the, where the major of that student is the major that we're aggregating over. So uh, the major that we're aggregating by, grouping by, when that major matches a student's major, I want to count that student's grade towards my mean. And so here then if I print out the average by major that we computed, you can see that the computer science students are indeed doing better on the, on the, um, in the class so far, which is cool. But then I had the state change up here where um, let's say we take the final exam and due to some scheduling reasons, Li Jia and I take it before Stefan and Huda and I totally tank the, the, the final. So when I run this, uh, this, this transaction, it immediately inserts these facts into the grade table and then it reruns all of these queries that are affected and it uh, eventually we don't quite have this hooked up yet. It'll be incrementally maintaining these, these outputs, which means that we're making the minimal amount of computation needed to go from the old output to the new output. So you can see now when I've added in uh, Li Jia and my final exam grades that it also affected the, the course average and now the physics students are in the lead. We'll have to see what happens when the, when the rest of the finals are done. So that's everything we wanted to share. Um, thanks so much for listening. Like I said, we've been really excited by the collaborations we've had in the past with Pluto developers and thinking through um, reactivity and performance in a reactive notebook. Uh, we're, we're still at the beginnings of our reactive notebook and uh, we want to increase our collaboration with the community and make sure we're exchanging ideas and talking through um, problems together and, and uh, sharing insights. So thanks for having us here and we're around for questions. Have a nice day. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, Thanks. Are you there? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Thank you. Really enjoyed uh, being here and seeing everything else that's been going on all day. Yeah. So while the talk was going, we in the in the chat like ah, asking questions. Um, there were also some questions on YouTube. Um, trying to answer the two questions right now. Was amazed by how um, like the reactivity is both changing changing over like declaration, um, and then also like reactive based on state updates. Mm -hmm. um, something that Paniotis pointed out is when you look in the video, your cells that mutate state, they're like shifted to the right to, to, show, um, <clears throat> to show that it mutates state. So question one is, can we steal that idea and also do it in Pluto? <laughs> <laughs>
So the shifting to the right, I, I, uh, we, so I, we've been building this notebook only over the last couple months, and it's been just coming together very quickly. And uh, so I went filming a video, and I was like, "Oh no, we we haven't finished this GitHub issue for visually distinguish update cells from regular query cells." So I just like right before filming, I was like, oh, "Maybe I'll shift it to the right." And so, but I think it actually looks pretty nice. Um, yeah, but I think um, it's interesting. Mm -hmm the whole model is really, it, it's, it's really, we're, we're lucky that we get to build a notebook for a stateful system like this because it was built from the beginning uh, based on this salsa package that we talked about at Julia kind last year, where, where everything we do from the bottom up in the database itself is tracking state, is tracking dependencies. And so um, everything is incremental the whole way, including the compiler, including the evaluator. And so basically, we're building up a dynamic um, dependency graph as we go. And so like, if you ask for what's the value of x, and to answer that, it first it goes and it says, well, what is the code for x? And it finds, OK, x is defined as y plus 5. And so then it says, OK, well, now I need to evaluate x. So then it finds out, oh, well, x depends on y. So it goes and says, well, what's the value of y? And then maybe y is actually a table in the database. Or maybe y also has its own definition. It, it could be either. And so then we go and we find that value. If it's a definition, we also run that one. And if it's a table, then we just directly read it. But in both cases, we like record this dependency. So then at runtime, when you change the either the definition for y or the state in the database for the relation y, in either case, it invalidates uh, x. And then we know to rerun it. Um, and so it's the same system throughout. Yeah. So it's like you have taken the whole Pluto layer and pushed it to live right next to the data. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's like we built we built the database from scratch with reactivity in mind in the same way that you built the Pluto front end from scratch with reactivity in mind. Um, exactly, mm -hmm. it's exactly the same principles, um, but across the whole uh, system from top to bottom, including in the compiler as well. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so a, a question I had looking at the uh, at the code you were showing was when you inserted something, you also had to delete something. Uh, that was counterintuitive. So what is going on there? That's yeah. Uh, that's so. It, so the language that we are demoing here is called RHEL, um, which stands for relational. Um, and uh, the the main theme of the language uh, and the system is that um, relational is the uh, best paradigm for doing anything with manipulating data. And uh, as part of sticking to that, all variables in RHEL are relations, kind of in the same way that if you ever use MATLAB, all variables in MATLAB are arrays or matrices. So in MATLAB, you can, you know, if you just write like five plus five, actually both of those are singleton uh, scalar matrices where they, you know, just have dimension one one or whatever, uh, and it will happily promote, you know, to and from. Um, and there's all kinds of problems with this in MATLAB, and I actually think the Julia approach to this is in some ways cleaner for matrices, but it works quite well um, in RHEL. So every variable in RHEL is a matrix is a relation all the time, um, which you can kind of think of as a table. And so relations in RHEL have set semantics, unlike in SQL, they have bag semantics. But either way, the point is a relation is a collection of values. And so exactly like you said, if you're going to, if currently the value is five and you want to change the relation to only contain the value six, you have to delete five and insert six. Uh, otherwise, the relation would now contain five and six because it's a, a collection. Yeah. OK, Great. is there a, a swap macro, like put this and take this out in one step? Uh, I did actually write such a thing while preparing this demo, and then I decided that it was too confusing. Uh, it would have—I I, I, okay. I didn't want to have to explain that as well or something, but maybe it would have been better just to abstract over it and have used that. But yes, uh, it is possible. I think more generally, of what I asked is, um, while working on RHEL, is there anything else where you thought like, "Wow, this could really work in Pluto"? Yeah, or in uh, yeah sorry. So I meant to get all the way back to your question. I, I, I'm also curious about that. I don't know. Like, I think um, I, I have never seen this idea before of having the system also be reactive to the, the state. I know other people have done it. Logic Blocks, which is a, a company that many of my coworkers previously worked at, did something like this. And I, I think there are other systems that do similar things. But I don't know to what extent. Like, the problem is that any arbitrary Julia expression can have side effects, and you don't know what they can be. And unless Julia itself has this reactivity built in, like you won't know what was affected. You know, if you have a Julia dictionary and then your Pluto expression just writes to the dictionary, how do you know that a different Pluto expression that reads from that global dictionary uh, needs to be updated? Um, and I, I don't know, but it would be really cool. So one trick yeah. you could do, and what we, what we kind of do right now, is if you have these separate state mod modification cells, you could just rerun every other cell. Like you have these special ones where when you run them, you just 
invalidate everything and run everything else, um, which is like not crazy uh, if your if your notebook is fast enough that 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 would give some of the right experience. Yeah. <clears throat> so one thing that Benjamin talked about was, um, or like talked about a long time ago was. You could just search for function with, with an exclamation point at the end because that's how Julia programmers say this mutates. Um, so that could work, but you also want to go down into your functions, maybe. And then... Well, and you have the opposite problem, which is okay. Even if you know which ones do the insertion, whether you do it, you know, via some special different kind of uh, uh, non-reactive cell. Like the the other thing about this is it only runs when you actually hit the the button, um, but. You know, in either case, whether you have some kind of non-reactive thing or you're looking for the, the bang functions, the problem is how do you know what to update on the other end? That's the hard part, and I don't know how to answer okay. that. In just and also, up. there's no convention which of the arguments is update. Of course, you uh -huh. can say that the bang function you can then invalidate or update every of the of every function arguments, but uh, this might be a bit of an overkill. But maybe it's the best thing which could be yeah. done without changing the core language or without going to compiler or, or interpreter level, level in the end. That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That might give a lot of the right experience. Yeah. I, I, that's mm -hmm. a cool idea. And so this problem actually keeps popping up again and again in different mm -hmm. places. And so recently it was with this new slider server mm -hmm. where you can run mm -hmm. all sliders and buttons online. People write these awesome notebooks that use, for example, a circular buffer to store the last positions that your slider was. In kind of give you the, for example, the random box notebook that we saw earlier today used to be written as an, an array of positions and it pushes to that array the new random position. But then if you put that online then every visitor is see, like sharing the path, the random path. Okay. So now when you're writing normal Pluto, you don't notice that this is a problem, but then when you run it online, you do. So it would be great if you could tell people like something is being mutated or yeah. So a, a, a similar problem. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to talk much more about this. Uh, uh, let's do that soon. Um, but I think now we should go on to our next talk, which is I think actually the, the final talk and it's it's by me. It's uh, a talk about new built-in package manager. Thank you, Nathan, for the amazing talk. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Bye. <laughs>